Welcome to this sermon from Silver Lake Baptist Church. Our mission is to celebrate the greatness of God with all we are for the joy, hope, and renewal of our community. We are so glad you have chosen to listen to our message. We pray you will be blessed by your time with us today. What's your mission? We have this church mission statement that gives us a hint about what our mission is as a church. You probably are a member of other organizations, maybe your workplace, that have their own mission statements. And I think it's important that people understand and are familiar with their mission statement because when people don't have a clear purpose, that tends to create a problem for us. One of the big causes of depression in our time is people not having a clear purpose for their life. So take just a minute and think about what is your mission. Many of you know that I believe the Bible offers an answer to that question for everyone and that I've drilled that into my kids' heads. So if we ask one of them what their mission is, they will say to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. That's why God put us here, to celebrate who He is and what He's done and to live in a relationship where we enjoy Him more fully and more deeply forever and ever and ever. We're going to change the game a little bit, though, and say, what if you were on a submarine in World War II? What would your mission be then? I heard it blow up bad guys. <laughs> and that, that's a pretty good answer. Primarily, the mission of submarines in World War II was to sink important surface vessels of the enemy without risking our surface vessels getting blown up. That was a huge part of the mission. But as the war went on, that mission expanded. I'm going to share with you one of the ways that happened this morning. There was a submarine called the USS Finback operating in the Pacific in the summer of 1944. And they had been doing their thing, right? Looking for Japanese tankers and Japanese supply ships and blowing them up. That was their job. But they got this radio message that they were to go hang out off the coast of this island called Chichijima. Not Iwo Jima, which you've heard of. Chichijima, which is a small island about 500 miles off the coast of Japan. And it was a big part of the United States island hopping strategy. Remember, the plan with Japan was to take islands ever closer and closer to Japan to cut off their access to the Pacific Ocean and eventually provide a platform for the United States to attract, attack mainland Japan. And so the mission these guys in the submarine got was, hey, the Navy's going to launch a huge carrier strike against this island, Chichijima, and we want you guys to stand by off the coast underwater so that you can be there to pick up any pilots who survive if they're shot down. So that's what they did. So obviously you can imagine if you're on the submarine and you've been sinking bad guys, that's pretty prestigious and that's what you want to do. But suddenly you're going to just camp out for a while and wait in hopes that somebody gets shot down and, and you can go get them. So on September 2nd, which was the first day of this offensive against the island, five torpedo bombers were shot down. Three of them were shot down in such a way that it was obvious that the pilots didn't make it, but two of them, there were life rafts afterward. The first life raft guy, uh, back then ejection seats on planes weren't like the cool rocket propelled ones that we have now. The ejection seat was you climbed and jumped, right? And if everything was cool and the plane was stable and you had time, you'd kind of tip the wings and let yourself roll out. This guy was, in, you know, his plane was shot up, so he was in a bit of a hurry to get out. And when he jumped out, his head hit the tail of the plane on the way out. So when he hit the water, he was not in a good shape, but he did manage to get into a life raft. And so saving this guy, the submarine actually had to come up right next to his life raft, pull this guy on board, and drag him in. Okay? There was another guy whose life raft got out, and the Japanese actually saw it, and they were strafing it. That means taking other airplanes and shooting their machine guns at the life raft. And so the submarine was staying underwater, watching this happen until the planes went away from it, and they quickly got the guy, and he survived also. So this same torpedo squadron that was involved in this had an attrition rate during this operation of 300%. Have you heard the term attrition rate? That's the percentage of the squadron that you lose. How do you have a 300% attrition rate? You're swapping in fresh guys and fresh planes. So if the squadron started out with 150 guys and planes, by the time it was all done, 450 were chewed up. So just phenomenal. This happened a lot in World War II in Europe as well with the bombers. You see these horrible attrition rates. So many were lost. So on this day, the Finback is out there. They save these two guys. They actually get them back to a, a, a Navy ship and get them home intact. 
Uh, both of them ended up continuing to fight in the war. But what most people don't realize is that on that mission, which was so boring compared and so unimportant compared to what they had been doing the rest of the war, these guys saved two United States presidents. Because the first guy they, got, they saved, the guy who hit his head on the tail of the plane going out, was George H.W. Bush, President 41, the one who just passed away this week. And if he didn't survive World War II, there would be no George Bush 43. So in pulling this guy out and doing this mission that nobody wanted to do, they saved two future United States presidents. Sometimes we're preparing for missions and we don't even know what's going on. Sometimes the life we're living is a mission that's more important than we can even begin to understand. And this morning, we're going to see two guys in the book of Acts who God is calling to a mission, who God is preparing for a mission. They have no idea what's going on. So if you have your Bible with you, turn it into Acts chapter 10. And as you're heading for Acts chapter 10, I'm going to pray for us quickly. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the incredible blessing you've given us of living in the United States of America, of having the freedom to worship as we do, of having the freedom to gather as a group of people who believe in you and to read out of this book in our own language that we can understand. We thank you for all of these gifts. And I ask that you would impress on each of our hearts that we would never take these gifts for granted, but that we would understand that when God entrusts his people with resources, he also gives them a responsibility. Help us to see the incredible resources you've given us here in our country and to use them each day and in each opportunity that you give us for your glory. Lord, as we look into your word this morning, help us to understand what we read. Help us to see the mission you've called us to and help us to be excited and energized, encouraged to take part in the mission to which we've been called. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Acts chapter 10, verse 1 says, There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. All right, who thinks centuria, the centurion named Cornelius is a Jew? So he's probably not one of God's chosen people, right? Which doesn't fit well with all the other stuff we read about him, right? So a centurion, what was he? He was a leader in the military, right? And, and not the state of Israel military, the Roman Empire's military, right? And it says he's a devout man and one who feared God with all his household. So he's what in most of the New Testament is called a proselyte, someone who is converted to Judaism from whatever pagan culture they've originated from and is now seeking to honor God with their life. Remember, they're not allowed to worship in the temple like the rest of the Jews, and yet they're still faithfully looking for a relationship with God. It tells us here that he's done this in such a way that he is communicating it to the rest of his household. So his family, his kids, his servants, the people under his authority in the military who live with him, all of them are, are being directed towards a relationship with God by this man's behavior. It says also he gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. He's devout. He's faithful. He's about the business of pursuing God, even though he's, he's not a child of Israel. He's not one of those chosen people. God has got a hold of his heart and is drawing him to faithfully pursue him. I brought something with me that some of you will recognize. What is this thing? It's a tripod. Why do people use tripods? Well, there's a lot of reasons. Um, in photography, how many of you think you can hold your hands perfectly still for half of a second? Half a second is not very long, right? It's no big deal. You can't. <laughs> Believe me, I've tried. Sometimes in photography, when we're taking pictures of things in the dark, you need a really long shutter speed. It means that the, the camera stays open, the aperture stays open for a long time in order to suck in as much light as it can. And when you do that, even at a half a second, which sounds like a super fast period of time, your hands will move. Has anyone ever tried to take a long exposure camera picture with your hands? It doesn't work. It's just a blur. Because even though we don't really perceive it, in reality our hands are not as stable as we think. They shake. And so you just get a big bunch of blurs. And I've taken thousands of pictures of blurs <laughs> because I've, a lot of my photography experience has been in the age of digital photography. So I can take as many horrible pictures as I want, and all I do is press the delete button. 
Back in the day when I first started, if I wanted to take a whole bunch of, bunch of pictures of blurs, I would have to waste money to buy the film and have the film developed and then look at the blurs, which I've now invested $10 in for a roll of blurs. <laughs> so we, we have this tool, which is a recognition and admission that my hands are not as steady as I'd like them to be. And I don't see when I go, which I, I used to do quite often, uh, is go on photography trips, especially for birds of prey. Many of you have seen my eagle pictures. I'd like to go out where there's bald eagles and they're feeding and take cool pictures. And there'd be tons of people with really, really expensive photography equipment, right? Like $5,000 cameras and $10,000 lens. And they're all out there. And they all have these big tripods. I've never seen any of them making fun of another guy for having a tripod. Because we understand that our hands are shaky. And if I'm going to waste $15,000 on photography equipment, I probably don't want a bunch of blurry pictures that might be an eagle somewhere in the distance. There's an admission, a recognition with photography that humans aren't as dependable or as stable as we might pretend to be. Our hands get weak. Our arms get tired. We shake. We wobble. And so when God is calling out to people in our brokenness, in our weakness, in our frailty, one of the qualities he develops in us and calls us to is faithfulness, dependability, stability, which is a contrast to how normal human beings are. We need tripods. And we see that this man, even though he's not a Jew, God is developing that characteristic in him. Notice the words that are used to describe him, especially in verse 2, a devout man. That means a faithful man, a man who's devoted, a man who's doing what God has called him to do. And it says he gives alms generously, which gives us the impression that it is a habit of his. He is habitually giving financial help to people who need it. And the last part of the verse, he prayed to God always. So if we want to be prepared for important mission for God, this is something that we should be seeking to develop. Faithfulness is good preparation for important missions. Faithfulness is good preparation for important missions. Our tendency as normal human beings is to pretend we're already faithful. I don't need a tripod because I'm stable and all by myself. I'm dependable and reliable and good. But this man was depending on God for those things and we must depend on God to be faithful. So if we want to be used by God for an important mission, one thing we should be asking him to develop in our lives is faithfulness. We should be looking for opportunities to show up when we say we're going to show up to spend time daily in God's word so that we are living in a faithful relationship with him. This guy is described as praying to God always. The Bible admonishes us to pray without ceasing. We should be living in a constant, living, vibrant relationship with God. What else can we learn about this guy and his preparation? Look at verse 3. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius... And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? Do you think being afraid and trembling before someone else asking them for their command was a normal position for this dude? I don't. He's in charge of military guys. He leads men into battle and wins over and over and over again. Or he doesn't make it to Centurion. He makes it to a dead guy who we all forgot about on the side of the road. But that's not him. This was a man who was in his position for a reason, and now he finds the tables turn. He's not the big authority guy. He's not the man in charge. He is trembling in front of this angel and saying, what is it, Lord? What is it, boss? What is it, person who's in charge of me? He's changed his position from the proud, bold leader to that of humble servant. And that is something that God does in people's lives to prepare them for missions. You can think of that and see it throughout the Old Testament. God raised up leaders who were people who had previously been humbled, often in painful ways. Think of Joseph and what he had to go through before he became a leader. And, and many, many examples we could use. Humility is good preparation for important missions. This is, again, contrary to the way we normally think about it. We think if we want to be the leader on a mission, we have to show everybody how cool we are so they'll vote for us to be the leader, right? But in God's economy, over and over again, we see this model is what actually works. The people he calls to lead are called to humility. 
And there's a good homework assignment and even memory section if you're feeling particularly aggressive this week. In Philippians chapter 2, the memory chunk is verses 5 through 11, but I encourage you to read at least the whole chapter, Philippians chapter 2, where Paul writes, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And goes on for the whole chunk to talk about how Jesus Christ humbled himself in order to save you. And do you remember how the end, that chapter ends? Every knee shall bow at whose name? Jesus, the name of the one who humbled himself, who has been given the name that is above every name and now sits enthroned at the right hand of the Father in heaven. God raises up leaders who have been humbled. So humility is good preparation for important missions. So now we have Cornelius in this humble position. He's asking for direction from this angel that has come to bring him a message from God. And the last part of verse 4, he says, So he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa, and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon a tanner, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. This is where we tie this week's message into last week's message. How did this Simon guy, Peter, end up at a tanner's house in Joppa? Well, remember, he was healing paralyzed people and bringing dead people back to life last week, and that's where he finished his story, we thought. But God wasn't done with the story. God's bringing people together from all different walks of life and different locations to accomplish his mission in their lives. And this is how we see God bringing these two individuals from all of humanity together to accomplish his purposes for their lives. And he still does the same thing for us today. Verse 7, And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. So when he explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. Okay, so in verse 5, we have this guy Cornelius getting a mission from an angel. This is what God wants you to do. How long did Cornelius debate and strategize about what the angel wanted him to do? How long was his analysis, cost, benefit, all that? I can't find it, right? So in verse 6, it's just continued direction about where he's supposed to go and who he's supposed to talk to. And verse 7, when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. So when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. As soon as the angel left, he allocated the resources for this mission and sent them to do what he had been instructed to send them to do. He obeyed immediately. This is another important trait if you want to be used on a mission for God. Quick obedience is good preparation for important missions. Quick obedience is good preparation for important missions. Has there ever been a time in your life when you felt pretty clearly from the word of God and your prayer life that there was something God wanted you to do, but you didn't quite feel ready to do it? Or often I remember as a teenager kind of the reverse scenario where I knew I was doing something that wasn't exactly what God wanted me to do. I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm going to stop doing that. And I would even talk to my friends, yeah, I'm going to not do that anymore. I'm not going to sleep in until 1030 and waste my whole day anymore. And then the next Saturday, guess what time I woke up? Oh, 1045, <laughs> right? We do this thing where we know what's right and we know it's what God wants us to do and we don't do it. Or we're doing something that we know would be, obedient to, would be disobedient to God and we continue to do it even when we've been confronted with the evidence that we need to change. And this is a, a big warning because we see this is the person God uses. Quick obedience puts you in the right position to be used for God's glory. Disobedience means you have to go through the hard process to get ready. And we talked about an example of this not too long ago with Jonah. Remember how quickly Jonah obeyed? Oh, wait, he didn't. He said, no, I'm going somewhere else. You want me to go to Nineveh? I'm going on this ship somewhere else because those people are scary and bad and I don't really care what happens to those people. I care what happens to Jonah. And God had to work obedience in Jonah's life, which affected Jonah's experience of the whole mission. I want to be quickly obedient. I want us to be quickly obedient. So when God says go, I go. When God says stop, I stop. And that's an important lesson for us to learn if we want to be used on important missions. On each of these three things we've talked about, faithfulness, humility, quick obedience, 
What special circumstances do you need in your life to start pursuing these things? None. God is preparing you today for amazing missions that you may not even see. You may be undercover in the middle of one of the most important missions of eternity and you don't even know it. That's what's happening to these guys. They don't yet understand the significance of what God's going to do for them. Many of us don't, right? If you haven't read Acts yet, you don't know what's about to happen in the lives of these men. But God's going to do something amazing through that. And they're just going through the motions of being obedient. They're being faithful, humble, and they're being quickly obedient. And let's see what happens next. Verse 9. The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners, descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Why is this an abnormal vision from God? What's weird about what he's being asked to do? So look at the list of animals. Four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. If you read Leviticus, you'll find something that many of those animals have in common. What is it? They're unclean. And if you're Jewish... Peter is. If you're one of God's chosen kids, what do you not do with unclean animals? You don't eat them. Some of them you're not even allowed to touch. And now he's got this vision from God telling him to rise up and kill and eat these things that were forbidden. So if you're Peter and you're having this vision, what is your response going to be? Look at the next verse, 14. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. I'm playing by the rules that you gave me. So I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to eat that unclean stuff or even common stuff. But what is God's desire for Peter? If you've read this, you know the answer. There's a reason he's having this dream. And the trait that's required of Peter in this circumstance is flexibility. God's going to broaden Peter's mind a little bit. He's going to call Peter beyond what Peter's been used to. And so flexibility is good preparation for important missions. And this is one that I've encountered in my real practical life over and over and over again. You get a bunch of kids on a mission trip in the middle of nowhere, and someone doesn't show up with something that you need to have, that you were supposed to have. You're planning ministry in a park, and you're going to play games, and the truck with the balls doesn't show up. What are you going to do? You have to be flexible. You have to be willing to use whatever resources God has given you at hand and perform the ministry that God's called you to perform. And there are times when you're going to have to work with people who see things differently than you. In ministry, even though we're all Christians, even though we're all coming here to the same church, we don't all have the exact same perspective on what's most important. We don't all have the exact same perspective on what color the carpet should be or the pews should be or whether we should even have pews at all. Maybe we should switch to chairs. Flexibility is good preparation for important missions. We saw in verse 14, Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. Verse 15, And a voice spoke to him again the second time, What God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. So why three times? What a weird scenario. Because Peter needed to be corrected. And maybe if it just happened once, he wouldn't get it. And maybe if it just happened twice, he'd make an excuse that it was some indigestion rather than God talking to him. But the third time, this must be a real message God wants me to get through my head. So what does it say? What God has cleansed you must not call common. So Peter says, not so, Lord. In most cases, I'm going to advise against that kind of language. Correcting God is not usually going to work out well for us as humans. He says, not so, Lord. That's how this vision kind of kicks off. But God corrects him three times. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. 
And the big mission that we haven't revealed yet and won't get to for a long time because we're heading into Christmas sermon season, so we won't be back to Acts for like a month. But the big mission is he's taking Jews and combining them with Gentiles. And the Gentiles are eating things that Peter would consider unclean. And many of the Jews who've come to faith in Christ would even consider the Gentiles themselves unclean. And God's saying, you know what? I'm going to bring you guys into the same tree. You're going to be adopted into the same family. And these distinctions cannot withstand the love of Christ. And so he's going to take these two men and use them to make that happen. But in order for that to happen, Peter has to be corrected. So receiving correction is good preparation for important missions. Receiving correction is good preparation for important missions. And man, has this been important in my life. I began in uh, vocational Christian ministry when I was 19 years old. I had been in Bible college for one year, and a church in Southern Oregon had a youth pastor internship opportunity available. Also, the pastor had a beautiful daughter who I had met at college, And if I went and did the internship, I'd get a lot more time with her. So there were a lot of motivations that led me to consider going to this church in Southern Oregon. And so I did. And that short-term internship ended up being a a longer stay where I served as a youth pastor at this church. But one of the first responsibilities I was given besides the whole youth group thing was teaching an adult Sunday school class on Sunday mornings. And I went into this adult Sunday school class all fired up to just do a brain dump on all these cool Bible things that I had learned in college with these adults who ranged from 30 to 70, and I was 19. (laughs) And so in my mind, these people are older than me. they are learned a lot more than me. They're going to need the full college, both barrels, lots of verses. And so I went in there. I had like a notebook, a binder full of my notes, just tons and tons of scripture references. And I would bring up a topic and then just quote like 15 verses in a row. Bam, bam, bam. This is all the evidence. What we're saying is absolutely true. Here's the Bible. Here's the Bible. Here's the Bible. And after about two classes of that, one of the kind of middle-aged men in the class pulled me aside after the class. And he said, Chuck, you are boring the people in that class to death. I'm really glad about your thorough preparation and you're telling them good stuff. But you can't just read the Bible to people for an hour every morning. And he was right. People were bored just watching Chuck read the Bible. And I had to learn that even in church, not everybody just wants to sit there and have the Bible read to them. They need to understand how it relates to their lives. They need to understand how it applies to me. And we need little stories to give us hooks into what's being taught. And so that correction made a huge difference, not just in my ministry to the adults in the Sunday school class, but to the teenagers. Because if you don't think 30 and 50 year old people like to listen to the Bible read to them, imagine a room full of teenagers having the Bible read to them. And I'd like to say that I was humble and quickly obedient and flexible and I instantly changed my teaching style, but that's not true. It took me time to be convinced from negative experiences that this man was right. And he was kind and loving in sharing that advice with me and not just being an obnoxious complainer which I should write off and ignore. But over time, it's changed. And God has enabled me to be a part of other missions, bigger missions, because I received correction. We all need to receive correction. And sometimes it's not just about something as simple as teaching style. We have sins in our lives that are preventing us from being effective in ministry. And we need to be willing to receive correction when confronted about sin. We have habits that lead us to wasting time And we need to be open to receiving correction about breaking those habits. We would rather spend time in pleasure than in ministry because we don't find the pleasure we're designed to have in ministry. All these things, God will bring people in our lives to say, hey, would you rather come help me out with this youth group activity? Or hey, would you like to be a part of this? And our tendency is to say no, no, no. But if there's a willingness, a flexibility, an availability to receive correction, God will change us, and God will use us for big, amazing things that affect the eternal destinies of the people around us through simple, quick obedience, simple willingness to receive correction. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time that you've given us here together this morning. Thank you for the examples of Peter and Cornelius and so many others in your word 
who you've raised up for important missions to further the kingdom, to share the good news, to bring unity and peace and love into the fellowship of your people. Lord, do that here. Use us for the mission you've called us to here to make this a community of people who is passionate about serving you, passionate about celebrating the grace of God, and passionate about sharing that message with the people around us. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to learn more about us, check out our website at www.silverlakebaptist.org.